Hi, everyone. We've set up this Being an Engineer podcast as an industry knowledge repository, if you will. We hope it'll be a tool where engineers can learn about and connect with other companies, technologies, people, resources, and opportunities. So make some connections and enjoy the show. I see it a lot, and I did it. I mean, I did, as a young engineer, and I had the senior engineer say, stop this. Stop skipping steps, right? One of the first things you're taught in engineering school is to draw your free body diagram. You know, people was like, look, draw your free body diagram. There's the solution right there. You just drew it. Hello and welcome to the Being an Engineer podcast. Today we're speaking with Danny Payne, who is a mechanical engineer and currently a senior principal engineer at Edwards Life Sciences. Danny has experience as an engineering expert witness and in process development and is an active user of Onshape, a modern cloud-based CAD program that we've talked a little about on the podcast before. Danny, thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. It's good to be here. All right. Well, what made you decide to become an engineer? Well, I've been thinking about this and thinking about the story of how I did that, as um, people have asked me. And I'd have to say when I was young, you know, starting just to play with the development toys, everyone had Legos, right? And you played with Legos and enjoyed the Legos. I had an Erector set that I really enjoyed to play with as a kid. I remember playing with that and building cranes and building cars and building things with the Erector set. Um, There was a Crayola drawing kit that actually had a whiteboard with a T-square and triangle and stuff like that. So it actually uh, show you a book on how to draw things. But then I'd go on from there and draw my own things using those drafting tools. So that was a lot of fun. Got into just really enjoying working on things. I had ta- take my bicycles apart, re-grease the bearings, put it all back together again, go out and ride, come back, take it apart, do it again. Uh, I would work on cars and such. Uh, my father wasn't mechanically inclined. Uh, so I was always the one who was just like, oh, I'll tear into that. Let's do it. Um, in high school, my senior year, I was uh, taking two hours of auto shop and the the teacher was saying, hey, why don't you go on to the community college and get a tech degree or get a uh, license as a mechanic? And at that point, I was like, no, I don't want to do this full time, but I want to design the car. What's Uh. that? (laughs) So um, I found out that's an engineer. And so I was like, that's what I want to do. And it's kind of funny, though, is incidentally with that, my, um, the auto shop class, the, per, the teacher ran like a competition skills test, right? And if you were in the first uh, two or three people in the skills test, you got some tools and you got a high school letter. So I finished second. So I ended up with a high school letter. A um, pneumatic torque wrench and a uh, tap and die set. So, oh, wow. How cool. So, I still have the tools, use those, the letters somewhere in a box in the basement, and my kids can decide what they want to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a great story. I mean, like classic engineering upbringing, right? Like hands on building cars. And that's, uh, that's awesome. So, now, now that you are an engineer and you, understand that design process, you are, are very well versed with one of the tools that we all use, which is CAD. And you use SolidWorks, as I understand. Uh, and you also use a program called Onshape. And I thought it would be interesting to talk about that just a little bit. Um, we actually had uh, uh, John Hirschtick, the, the founder of SolidWorks and Onshape, on the podcast a little while ago. And we talked a little bit about it then. Uh, but we haven't had like a, a user of Onshape on the show. So I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit about um, h- how did you come to, to learn on shape? You know, what, what was the reason behind that? 
And then what are some things about Oddshape that, that you maybe prefer from a, a user or functionality standpoint over SolidWorks? Ah, good questions. So with Onshape, I came to know it back when they did their Media Blast, or when they first started out. Um, I forget how many years ago that was. Uh, I was working for a company called General Atomic Systems Integration. We all got the same email because we're SolidWorks users somehow. They got our email addresses. We all pulled it up, signed up for the free account. Uh, I looked at it and I was like, oh, this is a little better than SketchUp, than Google SketchUp, which was out at the time. And played with it a little bit at the time um, and then just let it sit off to the side. Uh, Several years later, switched over to Edwards Life Sciences and some of my coworkers, we were talking about it. I said, oh, I should open that back up again. And so I opened it up. My account was still active. And I looked at it and I was like, oh my goodness, where have, look how far they've come <laughs> from several years ago when I signed up for it. So then I started playing with it and uh, started to design little knickknacks um, and such and looking at, okay, you know, what trinket can I, can I 3D print for my motorcycle? You know, what plastic little piece, what could I do for it? you know, um, on that and was enjoying it quite a bit. And so, uh, an opportunity came for me <clears throat> to actually do some contract engineering work at night, uh, an automated ga- gate company. Um, my sister actually owns it back in Northern Virginia, uh, gate logic securities. And she actually came to me and said, look, I have a customer who needs a professional engineer to design and stamp drawings for a gate that we need to ship to the U.S. Embassy in Mozambique. And so I was like, yeah, I don't know. And she, so she came back a couple of times um, and finally I said, okay. I gave her a quote for it. And she's like, okay, the customer says, good, let's do this. And I was like, oh, maybe that's too low. <laughs> but then I updated from hobbyist to professional and um, really got into the on shape. Um, I did the update so I could do uh, drawings for it and also keep the models confidential. When you're a hobbyist, they're um, out there for the world. Um, so I'd recommend if you want to keep something confidential, harder to find, like use your initials and some generic number. You know, Mm, because who is going to find that, right? (laughs) And I mean, come on. It's like when I was a hobbyist, who's going to care about a little uh, plastic bracket for a Yamaha WR450, right? Um, (laughs) No no, no actually proprietary there. But um, so I started doing some contract work and started to get into it more. And I was going through the tutorials. They have awesome video tutorials. I was blown away by by those because it's one thing. It's like the solid work. You go to the users groups. You go to uh, Go Engineers doing a lot of videos now as the VAR, and then the um, you know you get different groups that do it privately and things. But to actually have a company putting this much effort into their training videos was awesome, and so it was really quick and easy to pick up. Um, and just go with it. And I think that I loved about Onshape was I didn't have to buy a new computer. Like the computer we're talking on is probably close to 10, maybe 11 years old. Just a Dell desktop I picked up at Costco. And having Onshape as a uh, software, as a service, as a SaaS, it's all on the internet. So any device I have can access the internet. Um, access it, and then you can get on Onshape, right? Um, my son, years ago, for Christmas, he wanted a $150 laptop. Uh, we bought it for him. He since moved on. You know, he's now 21, buying his fancy gaming computers. But I pulled one of those laptops out, spent 150 bucks for it, you know, eight, eight years ago or something. It runs on shape awesome. <laughs> oh, that's I, incredible. <laughs> it is. It is so funny. I show it to people and I'm like, this little thing drives this because it's wow. cloud-based, you know? 
Uh, so on my phone, I can access it on my phone. And the thing is, is uh, like my son had a hobby account and I could share a model with him. We could be sitting side by side in the same assembly on the, working on the same parts, working on things. And with, with SolidWorks, you have to go in there and you have to make things lightweight. You have to say, okay, you have control. I don't have control. You have to refresh. You just cross your fingers and hope it doesn't crash and things. Uh, with Onshape, it was, I was just blown away at how well it did that. And then sharing files was so easy. Like I'd send them back to GateLogic and say, here, take a look at these. And I, I'd have to send them as a link. And they would just open it up and they had uh, read access and they could just look at it very quick and easy. Um, and I don't know if you've ever used through Google Docs how you can open a Google Doc and invite someone to see it and they can watch you work on your screen. And in Onshape, you can do that. And so you can say, hey, take a look. Let me show you. Open this link and watch what I'm doing and zoom in and out of specific areas of the assembly and parts and say, this is what we're talking about, right? Uh, so you can do it in real time um, and they can see it. And um, so I was just like, whoa, okay. You know, this is way cool. And the advances, <laughs> you know, the advances are coming every three weeks. You're up to date all the time. You know, at work, I'm, I'm on SolidWorks 2021. I'm kind of hesitating to go to 2022 because my, my graphics card is outdated on my laptop. That's only five years old. Um, and there's issues with it with 2021 with maybe 10 parts open in the assembly. And I don't want to give up the computer because it works. And I don't want the newer version because I've heard there's problems with it. You know, and I'm like, I, <laughs> so I'm like, please don't take this from the IT department. Mm-hmm. Another right, you know, your laptop's old and we should replace it. It's like, no, please don't. <laughs> it works. So, don't touch it. <laughs> that's exactly right. Right. So, I mean, you don't have any of those issues with uh, Onshape. And when um, before COVID, we had a users group meeting here um, for the Utah U- uh, Onshape group. Uh, one of my coworkers runs the SolidWorks um, users group of Northern Utah um, for over 10 years. He runs the Creo one. He uh, signed up to do the Onshape one back when they're doing uh, local areas. Now they just do it kind of on the internet. Everybody get together uh, nationally or regionally. But before that, it was in person. And so that was actually kind of cool. Um, and to go along with that is the add-ins that you can get for um, Onshape, the things you can turn on. And one of them that blew me away was this company called Onscale. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with them, but they're an FEA computer that, that or FEA software. Uh, that is the same idea. Is basically if you can access the internet, you can get on it and run it and. Holy cow, is that program awesome. So it would really act. Yeah, check it out. Check it out. It's like, and you can have a hobby account or a free account. You get 10 core hours a month, something like that. And they were just recently acquired by Ansys. Uh, but that's a, that's a different story, but maybe we'll touch on that a little bit. But, um, but I stayed with the professional account for the last several years for Onshape uh, for the contract work that I do at night. Um, and I love the advancements and they brought in simulation into on shape that's embedded in it, uh, which is really kind of cool and fun to play with. And if you go on and do the tutorial for simulation, they talk about, they're not gearing that towards a full blown analysis program, but they want to help the designer get a good feel for the design. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's a good placement. And I'm like, oh, finally, I understand what you're trying to do with this. Because when you look at SolidWorks and simulation that they have in SolidWorks, you're kind of like, what, what's going on here? You know, Are you really using the Abacus Insight here and the Abacus Solver? What are you using in here? You know, And you get Cosmos and stuff like that. 
And it's kind of like, okay, are you guys truly doing an analysis or is this just basically to help the designer have a good feel of the design? And then the design goes off to the full analysis group that actually dives in and does the deep analysis work. Um, so with the on shape, you know, and the mates, just the being able to connect things is quick and easy. Those main oh, really? pictures, when you learn them, it's like, oh man, <laughs> this is really cool. <laughs> you know, it's it's so interesting hearing you talk about this. We had we had John on the the founder of OnShape. And of course, he talked it up, right? Because it, he founded the company and, and, and it's his baby. Um, but it's a lot different to hear an actual user talk about it and and talk it up, you know, to the same extent as, as the founder was. Um, we're, we're actually just starting this, uh, this thing called CAD Club here at Pipeline, where we're opening our doors one, week, one day a week to uh, some of the youth in our community and bringing them in and, and showing them how to run CAD and teaching them a few engineering principles where the, this week is the first week. So I'm, I'm super excited for this to start. Anyway, um, I decided that we should use Onshape for this class because, well, all of the reasons that you just mentioned, right? There's, you don't have to have a high-end laptop for it. You don't have to help install files. You don't have to update things. They just access the cloud-based application and they can use kind of any old laptop. In fact, my, my son is um, one of the kids who's going to come and he has this, this, uh, school issued laptop and it's, it's a piece of junk, right? Like they are these cheap little laptops and just like your son, I guess, right? That $150 laptop, but he fired up on shape just to see if it would work the other day and it works great. No problem at all. So, uh, I, I of course don't have near the experience that you do yet. I've just played around with it for maybe a few hours so far, but it is pretty cool, you know, just the the modern technology, the the sharing and the collaboration tools and things like that. Um, oh, and then I'll I'll just second what you mentioned about the the training uh, resources they have. They have like a fully worked out training courses that teachers can use to teach on shape. So originally, I was like, oh, I'm gonna have to figure out not only how to use the software, but then like how to teach it to others. But no, Onshape already has all of those resources. They've got like PowerPoints that you go through and there's like a document for the students and a document for the teacher. And it's the documentation is really well done. I mean, very thorough and and just intuitive. Um, so anyway, I, I think SolidWorks and um, ProE or whatever they're called now, Creo, um, uh, NX, right? They they they've got to step things up because Onshape really brings to the table some amazing tools that these other uh, legacy old school programs just just don't have. That's so true, so true. You know, back like I said when we had that Onshape users group here in Utah's right bef- right when uh, Pro Engineer or PTC bought uh, Onshape, right? And the, so they went into a little bit of that and that. The people at PTC are like, we either have to take seven years to develop and get to where Onshape is now, and then they're going to be ahead of us, or we buy them and bring them in. Because yeah. you just can't take a old architecture of a program and dump it on the internet and have it as a SaaS. Um, you have to restructure. You have to redo it all. And I don't understand that. That's beyond me. That's a com- computer person, but I understand enough that you can't take something old and stick it into something new. Right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's that's great background for Onshape for all of you out there listening who are curious. There, uh, there's a free account that you can use, and it's I think it's fully fledged. I mean, it's for hobby use, right? You're not supposed to use it commercially, and, and like Danny said, all the files are public technically. Although I'm sure clever naming conventions can effectively. Uh, uh, eliminate that risk. But anyway, it, it's it's a great program. Super cool. Uh, go, go check it out. And I, Onshape is not paying me to say this. <laughs> I'll also mention. <laughs> All right. Well, let's see. Let's, let's maybe move on to another topic. Uh, you worked at a company called Alpine Engineering and Design, where the, the principal service offered is to be an expert witness for engineering-related legal matters. Uh, I don't think we've ever talked about this on this show, so I've been excited to to hear a little bit about that. Can you kind of walk us through some of your responsibilities at at Alpine? Like, what was your day to day operations like there? Well, when I started on at Alpine Engineering and Design, um, that was when I moved here to Utah. 
I was looking for work, found a posting at the Utah job site, applied for it, and was hired on and as a project engineer. And I was actually working projects. The uh, main engineer, he and another professional engineer were doing some of the expert witness work. So I would have been just a year out of college at this point. So I was a junior engineer. I specifically was looking for a company that had professional engineers I could work under so I could get my four years to get uh, vouched for so I could take my PE license. Uh, So I never had to do like the interfacing with any of the lawyers and things. I was more helping them uh, collect data or help them do uh, some testing or do something like that um, and working other projects and doing design work there. But what I was able to see and learn from those guys is amazing. You know, you think you do a great design, um, but things happen. Accidents happen. And so you start to look at that and you start to see, it's like, okay, well, maybe there was something at fault here. And one of the ones I, I share with people often, um, there, it blew me away um, that the owner, uh, Fred Smith, brilliant, brilliant guy, he um, was talking with a lawyer and, and it was a, uh, one of those rides right behind pallet jack. So a motorized pallet jack. And this lady, um, somehow it didn't, it, the brake didn't work and the pallet jack coasted and slammed her knees into a conveyor belt. So it hurt her, right? And so the question is, what happened? What went wrong, right? And you looked at the machine and everything looked right. Everything looked good. But Fred was able to find there was one spot in the position of the lever of the handle that put all the controls to the dead spot. So when CAD designing all the controls, uh, you know, you thought there was overlap or something, but there was one spot basically where the controls didn't work. Just so happens that day, everything aligned that the handle was in that spot. So it didn't work. And what he was going through in testing to find that is like, wow, he was really spending time on that machine um, and looking at it and doing it. And it's just like, it's just, it's a sad point, right? That the engineers, I'm sure they thought they had done everything that they could, that this wouldn't happen, but just everything aligned that day. Um, And so, you know, I don't really remember the outcome of that one. But I was just always impressed with the amount of work, kind of digging to the root cause of what could have happened, you know, and finding out and probably lessons were learned, designs were changed and so forth by that company so that no one else would get hurt because that's no one's intention, right? Um, There was other ones that was um, that were turned down. Basically, I remember um, there was one like with a table saw and the gap between the blade and the rest of the table. And he went out and he investigated and found that the more expensive the saws, the gap came a little bit bigger. So you could put different additions onto it. But as they started to dig deeper, the expert witness, or not the expert witness, the um, person who got injured had said that he had drunken a few cans of beer prior to the accident and cutting himself. And so it's like, no, we're not taking this one any further. Sorry. You know? Yeah. And so it's like the integrity to say, okay, we're not going to try and find something that isn't here, but pretty much, you know, um, once alcohol gets involved, it impairs people's judgment and that's going to be tough. But so I wasn't super involved with any of that. I, like I said, as as the um, E1, the level one engineer just helping out, but I was just amazed at the skills they were using to try and figure out the root cause and say, is there, you know, give advice to um, the legal team to say, maybe you do have a case here, but maybe you don't. Maybe you need to just kind of step away. You know? Do you feel like the experiences you had there um, – prepared you in any way to to be a product designer yourself 
It helped me think about people a lot, right? Um, it helped me think about what am I doing and am I doing everything I can to make sure the product isn't going to harm somebody, right? Um, when I was at General Atomics, I had the opportunity to draw, to design a test stand or a work stand that was two stories. Uh, I used to work on the C5 landing gear, big old gear, right? And then their old uh, equipment was outdated. It had been moved around several times from different bases. They needed new equipment. So we designed them some new equipment. So there would be people on that upper floor working. And there would be people below them working. And so, you know, thinking about, okay, you know, here are the standards laid out by the building code of what the floors need to be able to hold. And, you know, you think about it and you just, you, you hope, you know, the math is all there. Everything says it's all good. And you just hope the stars don't align someday that someone gets hurt by something because, I would definitely lose sleep, you know. It's like I try to stick with the good formulas that have been in practice, stick with the standards, and just do good engineering principles. And it, a lot of it does come back from seeing that work that these engineers were doing in these uh, cases, uh, being expert witnesses and, and the safety things. So I think so, yeah. 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 Well, let's see. You, you've um, you've been in the engineering space for for. Uh, quite a while now a few decades at least and i'm i'm, I'm sure that uh you've had opportunities to kind of move into management but uh and and correct me if i'm um speaking out of turn here but i, I think that you decided kind of not to go that route and 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 focus on being more of a, a subject matter expert you're a principal engineer now what what's prompted you to stay more in the kind of hands-on engineering versus going to like management when I, I've had experiences with project management and didn't like it. I didn't mm. like how I had to attend a lot of meetings and it took me away from what I consider the fun things of engineering. And also it's kind of like, you know, as a project manager, you have tasks assigned, you pass them on to other engineers, but you have really no authority to really say, hey, you got to get this done. You just go, hey, please, can you get this done? Please, can you get this done? <laughs> you know, don't don't make me go tell our supervisor or whatever, you know. And then it's like the accountability for the for budgets that you really don't have much to say about. Hmm. And, things. and so I really saw it and I saw some of my coworkers and stuff as they moved into management positions. Um, one of them. You know, he said, I just, yes, I took a, got a pay increase, but the amount of hours now that they're wanting me to work, it's now a pay decrease. Oh, interesting. You know? because, ah. <laughs> and so I was like, that's not good work-life balance, you know? Oh, and, and so it's been one that, you know, I, sh I shied away from. Um, I've always thought that if I could help develop younger engineers, but not necessarily have to attend managerial meetings and not have to deal with like, okay, the time cards and the other human aspects of it. Just like, hey, let me teach you engineering skills and help you with cab guiding you on designs and stuff like that and skills. I, you know, I was a soccer coach for 16 years thereabouts and um, teaching young kids the game of soccer was always enjoyable. And all, yes, I had to design the lesson plans. I laid out the game tactics, the technical stuff, but it was fun to get him to develop. But I wasn't attending meetings day in and day out on these players. And I wasn't having to report to a human resource person about these players or anything like that. It's just, just watch them develop and grow. That was fun. So, you know, if there was something like that, um, that'd be fun. But, but also another another part of that uh, was kind of like deciding who I wanted to be um, early on in my career as an engineer. I I was out of uh, college working for a company that was called Trim Systems. Uh, we are a tier one supplier to Freightliner uh, back in Portland area, and there was a uh, older gentleman. Uh, we and as engineers, you sit in the same room. 
meet lunch and things. And so during lunchtime, he'd spin his chair around and he's like, hey, Danny. And I'd spin around and say, oh, yes, what? You know, and he'd, he'd give me some word of advice, you know, something like that. It's like something he'd share. And one day he like said, um, hey, Danny. I was like, spun around and said, yeah, hey, Gil, what's up? Yes. And he said, well, I want to share something with you. And I was like, okay. He said, know who you are. I was like, okay. And he says, like, this is how I define myself. You know, I'm a son of a God, right? I am a husband. I am a father. I am, you know, an engineer type thing. And he says, those are my priorities in life. If you set your priorities, then there'll be time for everything else. You know, kind of like that analogy with put the big rocks in first and all the little stuff will fall in type thing. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, I've heard that before in things and um, kind of like hit me at that point. And uh, I remember going to a trade show to the, the big North America truck convention and sitting outside. It did not as kind of at a point, you know, you're fresh out of college. And you've had great experiences growing in school, right? Every every few months, you're learning a new subject. You're tested. You're advancing in skills, you know, uh, number crunching and things like that. And you get to the real world, and it turns into lots of document writing, lots of documentation. And, you know, it kind of gets rather frustrating, and kind of upsetting, right? That's like, this isn't what I went to school for. I didn't want to be a document writer, you know? And so I was at this show, and I I had a few minutes to sit and think uh, before the show opened. I thought about that. Who am I? And I said, who do I want to be as an engineer, right? And I thought, I said, I want to be an engineer who can design, analyze, and build mechanical things. And so that lifted my spirits, lifted me up, went through the show, um, and that's kind of been my motto and kind of like, kind of my, uh, thing that I've carried with me is what do I want to do? You know, I want to be that engineer who designs, analyzes and builds stuff. And I actually have that as my little thing underneath my picture on LinkedIn, you know? Um, so it's like, you know, uh, I don't want to be a CAD jockey who's just doing CAD work all day. I don't want to be the FEIA guy that's just doing FEA every day, day in, day out, you know? I don't want to be the mechanic, but I'd like to be able to have times in which I can do all three of those. And to me, that's the fun stuff. That's the fun. And that's what kind of keeps me going, you know, it keeps me in this. And so I graduated college in 1999. And here I am today still doing this, you know, still doing very similar to what I was doing back then. It's just better skills, hopefully quicker, right? More challenging problems. Yeah, that's terrific. So it, it's basically uh, like a professional mission statement, right? This is this is what I am. This is what I stand for. This is what I do. Um, that's very cool. I think a lot of organizations have mission statements or core values, and you know whether they follow them. I guess that's another conversation. But not many of us have personal um, core values or, or personal mission statements or professional mission statements. I think that's really. Um, insightful and 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 useful that that you've done that um i talk about time management sometimes and and people ask me uh, how do i use my time more effectively and and i always say well first you need to decide what you want you know like w- what's your goal at the end of the day and, and and probably they have some some goal that they want to accomplish and then i say okay work backwards from that uh, but your your professional mission statement is kind of that for I don't know, for, for your career, I guess, like this is the end goal, work backwards from that, right? Make decisions based on, on, on that, um, which I think is, is that's the most effective way to design or, or engineer careers to have, have the end in mind and then, and then work backwards. So I'm, I'm really glad that you shared that. Thank you. Well, I'm going to take a very short break here and share with the listeners that teampipeline.us is where you can learn more about how we help medical device and other product engineering or manufacturing teams develop turnkey equipment, custom fixtures, and automated machines to characterize, inspect, assemble, manufacture, and perform verification testing on your devices. 
Today, we're speaking with Danny Payne. So, Danny, you, you're a, a senior principal engineer at, uh, at Edwards Life Sciences currently. What, what does it mean to be a principal engineer? What does that term mean? That's a good question. Um, it's one that I w- have been thinking about, you know, and quite honestly, I get lost in these titles that are given. Um, I wish we, you know, we're given titles engineer one, two, three, four, five, six, right? It'd be easier to know the rank or if we use the general service ones, general service 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, you know, have a better alignment on that. Um, you know, and a year or so ago, my company realigned the titles, the names of them. Um, and so when I was hired on, I was hired on as a staff engineer and I was like, okay, that's fine. It's a title, right? Um, and it's roughly a level four or so. Uh, so now uh, the staff engineer, they did away with that name because I guess other industries are using the word principal engineer instead the staff engineer. And so then seniors, pr- senior principal is just one level up. Um, so at our company, we have engineers one, engineer two, then they go senior engineer, principal engineer, senior principal, then distinguished, senior distinguished, and so forth. Wow. Lots of different titles. There are, and it's pretty much the same thing, right? So, <laughs> so some people get hung up on it. I'm just like, don't worry about it. I think about your title. It's like... You know what? If you want one something, go go start your company, have it fail, and you can be top CEO of something, right? <laughs> um, that's where it is. But you know, when I was looking at it several years ago, someone shared with me, and I can't find it. I I've been searching for a while. There is actually a uh, mechanical society, uh, maybe SME or something that kind of compared the engineer level to the general service level of the government, right? And the expectations of it. Um, And so your senior principal engineer, like an engineer five or six, somewhere in there, right? You're getting involved in the community as far as like um, organizations, maybe SAMPI. Uh, You're getting involved in that, the um, SME maybe ASM, you know, you're kind of involved in them. Uh, when you kind of hit the higher levels, uh, maybe a seven or eight, uh, in whatever your company calls that, maybe you're on one of the boards inside one of those professional co- um, associations or something. So you're helping with the standards. You're helping write standards and things. But uh, to me personally, you know, um, as you've gained skills through the years and gained experience and exposure to different things, it's like being that senior principal engineer allows me to be able to help the new E1s, E2s, E3s, you know, helps me um, when they come up and ask, hey, have you seen this before? How have you done it? Or how could we attack this? You know, how could we do this? Uh, being able to have that experience and exposure to things to be able to help problem solve it. Um, now at Edwards, this is the first company I've ever worked at that's had so many diverse engineers. The, all the other companies I've been at, it's manufacturing engineers or it's been mechanical engineers uh, sprinkled with your electrical engineer or maybe a metallurgical engineer or metallurgist or something like that. But, but um Edwards Life Science has a lot of biomedical engineers. So, you know, you start thinking about, okay, what the schooling is like and how can you relate to how things were learned in school and such and be able to talk with them and work with them and help them learn, um, you know, stress strain curves and picking out different things on it and how that could relate to the product or something that we're trying to manufacture. Um so, you know, I don't have a real good definition for you, but, you know, I hope that works. No, that's helpful. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, let, let's. So you're in medical device, the, the medical device industry right now. But uh, prior to that, you were in the aerospace industry, designing landing gear, and, and now you're working on like tooling for heart therapies. 
Uh, so pretty different industries and and products. How did that how did that change happen? And like, what are some of the big differences that you notice between those industries? Ah, good question. The um, my last two jobs have been because my friends have called me up and said, "Hey, come check out what I'm doing, and we could use your skill set here." Uh, so I got into the aerospace industry from a friend and was there for 11 years working for General Atomic Systems Integration up out of Leighton, Utah, and we are a Department of Defense contractor um, doing the landing gear on the aging aircraft. So that was a lot of fun working on those projects and doing that um, work. And the last one I was working on was on the C-5 aircraft and uh, putting loads onto new axles that were 600,000 pounds and saying, can it hold the load, right? Um, and then had a friend, uh, we used to carpool together. Uh, he left General Atomics and uh, went to Edwards Life Sciences. And so after a couple of years, he called me up and said, hey, come check out what I'm doing. So I swung by after work to check out what he is doing. I was like, oh, this is interesting. This, uh, <laughs> this nitinol material, this nickel titanium alloy that I can squeeze and it pops back. And it's like, oh, that's cool. And I went to squeeze another stent. And he's like, no, no, that's chromium cobalt. It doesn't pop back unless we put a balloon in it and expand it up, right? And so he's like, hey, we're, we're needing somebody of your skill set and your abilities uh, would you mind applying and coming and working in the new process design area and working with this um, nickel titanium, this nitinol material? Um, so I applied um, and got the job. Um, and it's really interesting. It's people do ask, they're like, okay, you went from aerospace to there. And I'm like, it all comes down to beams. You know, I keep telling this to engineers and they always laugh. And so I'm starting to win people over, but pretty much, most things you can break down to a beam and a beam reaction. And whether you're putting 600,000 pounds on a beam or, you know, you're putting an eighth of a pound on a beam, you know, it's just the size that you're dealing with and the magnitude, but it's still your sigma stress is your, your bending moment times your C over I, right? It's yeah. just the size, you know, and, you know, I, I'm just like amazed that you think about um, Isaac Newton, you know, stating, you know, the force is equal to mass times acceleration. And what we do with it now, it's like, holy cow, after all this time, it still breaks down and it still works. It flies aircraft, you know, it helps them land. It puts things in people's heart to extend their lives. And it's just, it's the same mechanical equations just the different magnitude. So it's actually a lot of fun. It's all Newtonian physics, right? Uh, until, until you get into quantum physics, it's all the, the same equations, no matter how, how big the, the parts are you're working with. That's I, I love that you <laughs> you put it that way. It all comes down to beams. <laughs> I don't think I've heard someone put it so eloquently before, but that's, yeah, I, I can't disagree with that. That's great. Yeah. yeah it's funny. People ask me, I'm like, you know, have you done your free body diagram? You know, have you sketched it out? What are your loads? And look, there's a beam. What's yeah. the beam equations? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, can Can you think of any projects that you've worked on or or technical problems that you solved? Um, and 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 one that hopefully you can share. And if you can't share any of these, that's totally understandable. But is there a project that comes to mind where? your team had some kind of engineering problem and you had to overcome it. So like, what was the problem and, and, and how did you, how did you end up overcoming that technical problem? Boy, that seems like the whole career, right? Um, <laughs> Where to start? Yes, exactly. Um, I give you several examples, uh, probably throughout my career. Um, way back when I was working for trim systems, you know, we were a tier one supplier doing interior trim and doing manufacturing tooling. And you have to store the tool somewhere. And, you know, trucks are big, these uh, trucks. And so the interior trim pieces are big. They're big tools. And uh, Freightliner was coming out with the Columbia Series truck at that time. And you had your different um, colors and your different holes and your different everything you can put into those. And so the tooling 
And so we came up with a tooling that actually could use inserts that you could actually, for the still rule die, you could change out the inserts. And so you'd have one big tool with a whole bunch of different inserts and you could get over 350 part numbers off of that. But yet to store it was easy, right? Yeah. Well, so that was pretty fun and amazing. Yeah. Uh, uh, Engineers are just the greatest, right? I love the, the solutions that we come up with. That was fun, yes. Very much so. Um, you know, they're at Alpine Engineering and Design. Uh, one of the ones that I, I enjoy on that is uh, a gentleman. You know, you get a lot of um, people with million-dollar ideas, right? They have a million-dollar idea that they want to get fabricated. This gentleman took his million-dollar idea of a conversion kit for a bicycle to turn it into a human-powered snowmobile. And I uh, took it to Brigham Young University. Seniors did their capstone project on it. It was nice. He brought it to us to uh, make it better. The, anyway, I won't go into all the details, but it was it was a fun project. Uh, I got, uh, we updated the patent uh, as an inventor, and it was a uh, fun experience to turn that into that and to get it working. Um, I don't know whatever happened to it, but I saw something similar to the design on the market several years ago. And I was like, I wonder if he sold the patent to somebody and that's actually it. That would um, be cool. Yeah. Yeah, it would be chance to know that. But I'll show people as I cap the, the process, went through that to problem solve. General Atomics, uh, we had that one stand uh, working on the C5 landing gear. It needed to be updated. Uh, what they had... Uh, the second floor was being supported by cables, um, so it would shift around under the operators um, and such while I was on there. And I was like, no, oh, that's not too good. So, you know, coming up with the idea and how to actually make that work, that stand work. And we had flooring panels that would lift up using electric actuators so the gear could actually go in and then those floor panels would close and support the weight of of the workers so they could be up top on the upper portion, working on the upper portion of the gear and people down below working on the lower portion of the gear. That wasn't an easy one to solve either um, to get that into the space constraints and things that we needed to get it into. Uh, but that was a fun T project that we worked on and did, um, you know, at Edwards Life Sciences uh, coming up with um the new process um, line for manufacturing, you know, as the product's going to market and it's decided, hey, this is uh, going to market, you need to design the uh, process for high volume. And the area of the process that I'm involved in is the shaping uh, of the nitinol material. So you get your raw material that's either a round tube that's been laser cut or it's a flat sheet that's been laser cut, and you think about the sheet metal, and you have to form it. But this material, you know, like titanium, takes a lot of force and heat to do. Well, this stuff with the with the nickel in it and being super elastic and such, you actually have to form it in the tools, and then you have to do an annealing heat treatment to get it to stay where you want to stay. Um and to be able to work with that process and get it to the point where okay. We can make, you know, a large quantity of these uh, devices that are ultimately going to end up in people to help extend their lives and help to solve an issue with their heart. Um, so it's kind of fun and it's really neat. It's very challenging. The material doesn't like to stay still um, and to be able to get it so you can get those high volumes. Uh, so every... Every company, you know, those are some highlights, some fun activities, working as teams um, and being on those teams to be able to accomplish those fun things has been great. Very cool. Yeah, thank you for sharing all of those. Um, I think maybe we'll, we'll do just a, one or two more questions and then, and then wrap things up here. Um, what, uh, you've been doing this a while and you have so much experience and I'm, I'm really interested to hear how you answer this this question because of all that experience you've you've seen a lot um a uh, a lot out there in the world of engineering what what are one of the one or two of the things that slowed down the speed of engineering 
Boy, that's a good question. Slow down the speed of engineering. Um, sometimes I think when skip, when steps are skipped early in the process, uh, one of them is not having a good definition of what it is you're actually doing. Uh, what does the product need to actually do? Um, the product design is not real well defined. Um, agreements between the contractor and the customer the end user, whatever it is, it's not well defined. And so when you start going through the design process and we're like, oh no, we wanted it really this way or we want it that way, um, you end up doing a lot of twisting and turning or you feel like you're trying to hit a moving target. And I think that if you spend the time up front to define what it is you're doing, you know, make sure everyone's in agreement and understanding, um, that saves. And even like when do you get to the point where you're working on it? Um, I see it a lot, and I did it. I mean, I, did, I was a young engineer, and I had the senior engineer say, stop this. Stop skipping steps, right? One of the first things you're taught in engineering school is to draw your free body diagram. And people was like, look, draw your free body diagram. There's the solution right there. You just drew it, right? Where's the problem? <laughs> Right, you're you're not accounting for that force. You're not accounting for that moment. You know, oh yeah, you know. Okay, let's let's iterate. Let's go back. Let's update the design. Let's update the thing. You know. So I think it's like when I'm working with young people in math, when I'm working with them in engineering, it's like we all want to rush to the solution, and we think we can do all these steps in our heads. But when you start when you start skipping steps. That's when you actually end up inducing mistakes, and then you got to go back and fix those mistakes, so it takes longer to do. So I'd say, yeah, define your problem up front and don't skip steps. <laughs> yeah, our, our engineering manager here likes to say, when when you want to move fast, slow down. <laughs> it's a good, good idea. Yeah. Well, uh, let's see, uh, specifically within the context of your role as an engineer, what is one thing that frustrates you and conversely, one thing that brings you joy? Oh, uh, one thing that frustrates me. Um, I think when, you know, you've worked hard and you're trying to get that solution and just something doesn't work out right. The material just doesn't want to stay put. Uh, spring back gets you out. Or something that's just like, ah, oh, I got to iterate the tooling again to try and get this. Um, or something where I skipped a step and I got to go back. It's like, ah, oh, why did I do that? I didn't follow my own idea and my own principle. Don't skip steps, right? And you got to go back and redo it. Um, I mean, I won't bring up management, you know, people who control the money and time and schedule and stuff because it seems like we never have enough time to truly polish that mirror and things, you know, it's like, okay, you're done. Turn it in. Get, you're done on the assignment. Um, but some of the things that I really enjoy is, you know, seeing that the product can help people, um, seeing the fruits of your labor, seeing what can be done, you know, uh, when I get that process working and can hand it off and others can use that process and make product. Uh, when you see a product that is out in the world, that's like, Hey, I worked on that and it's, it's there, it's running, it's working, it's good. And so far no one's gotten hurt. So that's good. You know, um, those types of things are definitely very rewarding. Nice. Yeah. I know what you mean. Uh, uh, my family went on a, a little weekend trip, up north uh, to a, a cabin in the woods this this past weekend, and uh, it was an Airbnb we we're staying at, and they had uh, these these uh, lights strung up outside, and so we'd we'd plug the lights in at night and sit outside in the cool weather and just enjoy really nice uh, ambiance out there with the lights. And when I went to plug these lights in, there was this outdoor um, uh, electrical uh, cover. And and I, I looked at it and I thought, huh, that looks really familiar. And I, I looked at it a little closer and, and I realized, I, I'm pretty sure I designed this <laughs> like 12 years ago. And, and sure enough, the company that had hired me was was stamped on uh, on the product. And 
I could even pick out individual features and, and think to myself, I remember designing like that individual feature right there, the, the shut off for the, the hinge and all those things. It was, it was really cool, you know, when you see your work out, uh, out in the wild, so to speak. So true. Yeah. Well, um, Danny, uh, how, how can people get in touch with you? Uh, go ahead and get in touch with me through maybe good LinkedIn. Um, I'm listed as Daniel Payne, comma, P-E, uh, there on LinkedIn. Just go ahead and reach it out to me. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, this has been a, a delight. Thank you so much uh, for taking some time and, and just sharing your background and experiences and, and some fun stories with us. I, I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you for having me on. I'm Aaron Moncur, founder of Pipeline Design and Engineering. If you liked what you heard today, please share the episode. To learn how your team can leverage our team's expertise developing turnkey equipment, custom fixtures, and automated machines, and with product design, visit us at teampipeline.us. Thanks for listening.